The days of Noah, as you know, we're all familiar with that, but there's a lot of significance there uh, for thus for us today. Matthew 24, 37 says, But as it was in the days of Noah, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. So so what we have to look at as we long for him to come back, as we long for the rapture, we have to remember that it's as is in the days of Noah. So it's definitely worth looking at. The flood is significant for us today. It's not just a, a historical uh, Bible, historical, you know, overview. It's something that applies to us today. For instance, when you get to that scripture, the words, but as, so it said, but as in the days of Noah, it means exactly when you, in the Greek, it means exactly precisely as it was. So it's, say, it's saying that as in the days of Noah, it's going to be exactly precisely like that for the Son of Man to come. And then, it, and so shall uh, be in Greek uh, means that it, in keeping or in line with. So, you know, it means that just exactly as it was before the flood, it'll be just before the Lord comes again. And so we have to look at it. Well, what was it like? before the flood. You know, I used to look at that. Uh, they were eating and drinking and marrying and just, I kind of took that to mean that, well, life was going on. You're kind of, you know, whistling along, <laughs> just kind of floating along. That's not what it means at all. But to get there, let's back it up just a little bit and, and go through the lineage because we know Noah, that God chose Noah. We know that he was a, a righteous man, you know, that he was obedient to God. But his line is so pure and so long. And here we start with Jared. You know, he lived when the problem of the watchers began. The watchers are the angels that were uh, God's uh, ordered to oversee things here on earth after, um, you know, the Adam and Eve. And, and he was the father of Enoch. Of course, we know Enoch. Enoch was one of two that we know of that was raptured up, that was taken up without experiencing death. And he was the father of Methuselah. And then Methuselah, of course, is the oldest living human. I think it was 960 years, something like that. But his name means when he dies, it will come. So uh, basically a, a prophetic thing that when Methuselah dies, the, the judgment would come. And he was the father of Lamech. And Lamech was the father of Noah. So in essence, Enoch was the great granddaddy of Noah. And we're looking at a really pure, wonderful, godly line of people. You know, uh, Noah, he had godly influence from all those people. They taught, you know, from the generations, all the things that they knew. Uh, Noah knew the, the teachings in and out. And he was warned of the coming judgment. It wasn't a surprise to him because his ancestors had told him that the time of judgment was coming. So one generation passed the word of God. God on to the next generation as it should be, right? And so what are we doing to pass that word of God on to the next generation? You know, we talk about, maybe talk about Jesus. Jesus loves you. You know, we, we try to be a good witness, but what are we doing to really uh, carry on or pass down the word of God uh, precisely in what we know and what is coming? Noah is called the preacher of righteousness in 2 Peter 2, 5. What a beautiful thing. I'd like to be a Noah. He preached and he warned people that judgment was coming. He warned them to repent. Certainly, we, we, we hear that every week here, right? It's gotta, I say that I refer to myself as a watchman on the hill, but they didn't take him seriously and they ignored his prophetic warnings. So Jesus tells us again in Matthew 24, 38, that right up until the last moment preceding this cataclysmic event, the flood, you know, uh, everyone and they were, the world was eating, drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. So they were going on, even though they had been warned, they were strongly warned about the judgment. In Greek, though, all of these words aren't what I thought they were. I thought it was just like, oh, I was just living. No, no, no. In the Greek, when we break it down, that eating, drinking, and marrying, uh, giving away in marriage, it, it's a continuous form. It's like insatiable, like they couldn't get enough of anything. So they were partying, they were eating, they were uh, given into marriage. And uh, you remember in, in the Bible, you know, uh, this is talking about marrying and remarrying and remarrying. We see, unfortunately, that today. But in the Bible, it wasn't so simple. You see, you didn't just, you know, divorce and get a new wife. You, the certificate of divorce back then was really a legal document to give another man a right to take the woman that man didn't want anymore. And so a lot of this marriage stuff is going on, just, just a horrible thing, uh, you know, in terms of where God said so. They were insatiable in every sense of the word. Genesis 1 says, now it came to pass when men 
began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them that the sons of God, which I put here, by the way, are the, they're the fallen angels, saw the daughters of men and they were beautiful and they took wives to themselves, all who, who any whom they choose. So basically what we're looking at here is, uh, you know, we're talking about angelic beings. They're, they're the watchers. Uh, they, they were, you know, God put them uh, in place to watch over things and they left their, uh, their home. So they came basically lusting after women, you know, uh, and, and they took them as their wives. Now, we can't understand that. But, you know, I was saying this morning at the well that we don't need to understand everything. But gone are the days where we just skip past things we don't understand. And I don't believe there's anything irrelevant in the word of God. And so this is there and we're going to take a close look at it. And the Lord said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. They were the mighty men who were of old and renowned. Now, so I'll, as I'm researching this and I'm looking at what the theologians say, you know, there's some of them say that. Uh, these giants, the Nephilim, the children born to these angelic beings and these women, you know, uh, they were just talked about because they were so mighty. They were so big, you know, they were, you didn't miss them, but they were vicious, horrible uh, things. And we're going to uh, read about that in just a second. So some people think that it was just the legend of them, that they still talk about them before and after the flood. But it doesn't say that. More people look at it and really, frankly, don't understand what happened with these giants. And there is some significance to this, by the way, and, and that they were uh, giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards. So, uh, you know, this really... Um, more than anything is the source of judgment uh, that happened in the days of Noah. And so we're going to look at that. So that word strive, I, you know, it says, I'm not going to strive with you forever. That word strive uh, means to to struggle or to contend is probably the best way to put it. God saying, I, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to contend with you forever. He, he, he's had it. You see, Everything he made that was perfect and beautiful now has been, the bloodline has been corrupted. It's been defiled. It's not just what he created. It's some horrible combination, you know, some offspring of, of these spiritual beings with the women. Our English word for this agonize, it, it comes directly from the Greek verb uh, agizonami. I'm sure I'm butchering that. The root of the word uh, is noun agon, which means struggle or contest or opposition. So again, he's saying, I've had it. Uh, I'm not going to deal with y'all forever. You know, this is uh, out of control. You've corrupted my world. My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now, some people take this 120 years to be the, the numbers of the days of man. In other words, our, our years will be limited. And, and, and that is true. It could be. But it seems like it's out of context in that sense. So it says here, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Oh, and his days shall be numbered. No, he basically what I see, at least, is that he's saying, I'm going to give you 120 years. And so, you know, you've got 120 years to clean this mess up. I can't strive with you forever. Uh, I'm, I'm going to give you 120 years. And of course, that's how long it took Noah to con complete the ark. So Noah preached, and you imagine, with everything within him for 120 years, and there was no change whatsoever. And so God, in his all infinite mercy, uh, you know, gave that gap of time, I guess, uh, you know, to see what would happen. He already, of course, is in tomorrow, so he knew. But he was saying, I, I, I'm done. I'm not going to contend with you. I'm a, your days shall be 120 years. Gave him time to complete the ark. And in Genesis 4, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterwards. Now, we have, we certainly know of giant, the stories of giants, right? And especially in the, in the Old Testament. And we would know that David and Goliath, Goliath was one of these giants. Uh, and every man, uh, you know, there was afraid to fight him until God gave the spirit to David and David went in with a slingshot and killed him. So it's not surprising that they're there, but they're supposed to have been, uh, you know, violence. Like, like they did some more big people. They were horrible people. They were, you know, they're just violent people. So what kind of, you know, violence did they bring? Well, the real word, the root word for uh, the violence that they brought is Hamas. Isn't that interesting? So it's in the Hebrew Bible's primary term for violence. And it's first used in Genesis 6, 11, where it says, the earth was corrupt in God's sight 
and the earth was, earth was filled with violence. It occurs 60 times in the Hebrew Bible. It's almost always used to identify physical violence. Hamas, isn't that just crazy, right? And so they were violent men. They intermingled sexually with women, and the results were giants. And we listen, we, it doesn't matter what we understand. It matters that, you know, clearly the, the, the word of God feels this was important news, right? This was important stuff. You know, I am forever saying, I want to see the glory of God. I want to see Shekinah glory. I, I want to see all the supernatural things of God. Well, I can't just take those beautiful things that I want to see, the supernatural things, and negate everything that seems a little weird to me. I believe that as we approach the end times, things are going to get really weird, as in the days of Noah. I'm not sure we're going to see giants, but things are going to get really weird. So it says in Jude 6, the angels, which kept not their first estate, which some translations say their abode. In other words, they left where they were supposed to be, but they left their own habitation. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto judgment for that great day. So these angels, these fallen angels, they are not demons, by the way. These are fallen angels. He locked them up in chains and they're sitting there, you know, in the abyss in the darkness waiting for judgment. This verse, uh, it provides provides us really super important input. So it, in it's parallels to 2 Peter uh, 2, 4, where it says, God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So here we are, uh, repetition, you know, confirmation, if you will, that these fallen angels that left their uh, abode, that, that lusted after women, uh, sons of uh, daughters of men, and, and co-intermingled with them sexually, and had an offspring that they, they're locked up in hell now these chained angels cannot be the same angels um, as the principalities and powers of darkness uh, that are in higher places and again we read that in, in ephesians 6 our struggles not against flesh and blood you know but against the principalities you know in the in the heavenly so it's not the same thing these guys are locked away so they are apparently the uh, spirits in prison uh to whom christ preached when he descended in hades and in the spirit while his body was resting in the tomb and in the next verse we learn that they had been disobedient so this is all confirmed is what i'm getting at through the word of god where these angels fell they did bad stuff and they're locked away they do not confuse these fallen angels with the demonic ones so giants what is, what does giants mean well in greek it's nephilim and so they're the fallen ones they the ones uh were physically enormous you know they possessed unnatural strength and propagated evil and violence so we know that um you know we see accounts of these giant men we remember when the spies were sent in and came back and said oh my gosh we're like grasshoppers to these guys uh we, we remember of course again goliath we know that king og you know they used to make beds that were basically to fit custom fit the kings and his was like 13 feet long and seven or eight feet wide he was a massive he was one of the giants and so it, they're enormous uh, but they, they they had unnatural strength. I, I think there may be some correlation with, you know, as we hear about people uh, with demonic possession, for instance, where they have supernatural strength and takes a whole tribe of people to hold them down kind of thing. They were possessed with unnatural strength and they propagated evil and violence. So that's what God's saying in the days of Noah, eating, drinking, marrying, violence. It's, it's just a horrible world and i'm going to parallel that in just a second genesis 6 5 then the lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and the lord was sorry that he made man on earth doesn't that break your heart that he made such a beautiful thing beautiful creation and he got to a point where he said i'm sorry i even did this he, he was grieved in his heart what he created the beautiful creation of man and woman had been defiled the whole bloodline so the lord said i will destroy man whom i have created from the face of the earth both man and beast creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. One of the saddest things we'll ever read in the word of God. 
And then in verse 11, the earth was also corrupt before God and the earth was filled with violence. So the corruption, if you do a study on that, goes right to the Nephilim, right, right to the offspring of the, the fallen angels and the women. And, and the earth was filled with violence. And of course, they were behind it. So God looked upon the earth and indeed it was corrupt. For all the flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. We had destroyed or man had destroyed uh, through this uh, nonsense with the spiritual world, everything he created. So the bottom line is the events that we read about in Genesis, that they're real. OK, it's not just some story, not something somebody made up. And, I, and again, I, I get kind of frustrated because I, I can remember sitting there you know in churches for instance and genesis 6 would come up and just kind of skip over it like we don't understand it i don't understand it i don't claim to but i i definitely think it's important for us to try to understand it not just skip over those things we don't understand the bible is filled with things of wonder and things that just you know make us go wow filled with things we don't fully understand but that doesn't excuse us and it certainly doesn't mean we dismiss what we read so again enoch was the great grandfather of Noah, and he was the prophet. Uh, you know, the um, he saw that he received the word of the Lord. He saw the evil, and he wrote about it. And we actually are going to look at some of the excerpts from the book of Enoch. It's not uh, it was never uh, part of the Bible, uh, but Enoch wrote this book, and the the Jewish people for all these generations have studied the book of Enoch because he wrote what the accounts of what he saw. Genesis five twenty four. It says Enoch walked faith fully with God then he was no more because God took him away so again he was favored by God I don't know he was a prophet maybe he for he could foretell these things he eyewitnessed some things but it's uh he definitely you know put a lot more detail to what we read about again in Jude 1 6 and the angels who did not keep their positions right of authority they were an authority God trusted them to be watchers but they abandoned it um, he is kept in darkness. And uh, again, Second Peter 2, 4, I'm bringing this up again, because both of these scriptures and many more, by the way, are, are the references came from the book of Enoch. So you can see he, the book of Enoch quoted throughout the, especially the New Testament. And so these are our accounts, right? So I'm going to just uh, share some of this with you from the book of Enoch. And there are others that are um, you know, there were theologians, uh, you know, experts, Jewish, uh, you know, priests, um, you know, that have written about history right along the same time, basically confirming what we read in the Bible. Not that we need it, but I think we need to shed some light on it. So Enoch's uh, first Enoch six, one through eight says, and it came to pass after the children of men had increased in those days, beautiful and comely daughters were born to them. And the angels, the son of the heavens, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, behold, we will choose for ourselves wives from among the children of men and will beget for ourselves children. And Semjaza, <laughs> I'm sure I'm butchering that, who was their leader, said to them, I fear that perhaps you will not be willing to do this deed and I alone shall suffer for great sin. So this one guy, uh, the leader of this pack, says, I'm not going to be out on a limb by myself and suffer for everybody else. So uh, then they all answered him and said, we will all swear an oath and bind ourselves mutually by a curse that we will not give up this plan, but we'll make this plan a deed. And then they all swore together and bound themselves mutually by a curse. See how far away from God they had gotten, right? Verse Enoch 618, and together they were 200 of them. So the account is there were 200 fallen angels, and they descended on Ardis, which is the summit of Mount Hermon. And they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn on it and bound themselves mutually by a curse. And these are the names of their leaders. Um, I'll let you read for yourself and you might want to take a screenshot of that. I'm not even going to try to do that. But these were the leaders. And the point is that they actually, there is an account of the leaders of this heavenly tribe, right? And uh, it came from the book of Enoch. And then Enoch 7, 1, 6 says, and they took unto themselves wives and each chose for himself one. And they began to go into them and mix with them and taught them charms and conjurations and made them acquainted with the cutting of roots and wood so what they did i think a couple of things that are interesting here and it said in the bible also basically uh 
you know, they chose a woman. He, it doesn't sound like there was any mutual meeting of the minds with the with the fathers or anything like that. It was just like they picked them. And I don't know that these women had a choice. We don't know, right? But we do know that what we're seeing now is they went from, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll make a curse and we'll make a bond. And, and now here they are. They're actually teaching witchcraft to the women. So they're corrupting everything that that, that God created. Enoch 7, 1 through 6, and they became pregnant and brought forth great giants. These, these devoured all the acquisitions of mankind till men were unable to sustain themselves. So they were like uh, locusts, I man, they came through and they devoured things. They were they were frightening. They were vicious. Uh, we'll read here in just a minute how they they, they drank blood. They, they even defiled animals. So these things in the days of Noah, it's corrupt world from one end to the other, right? And and they, they, they there was no end to it. You can read uh, Josephus. He was a Jewish priest, a scholar, you know, uh, and, and he wrote a, a, a good deal about this as well. But I just have an excerpt for many angels of God accompanied with women and begat sons that proved unjust and despisers of all that was good on account of the confidence they had in their own strength for the tradition is that these men did what resembled the acts of those whom the Grecians called giants. So we see that over and over and over, you'll see that the bodies had, uh, the giants had bodies so large and continents so entirely different from other men that they were amazing to the sight and terrible to the hearing. So apparently they were loud and scary. I guess if the, it'd be the, the, the best way to define them would be they were monsters. What we talk about monsters in our life is these were monsters, right? The bones of these men are still shown to this very day, unlike uh, any credible elations of men. I am told that in Israel, uh, you know, that they have some of the bones of the giants on display. There's proof, there's uh, archaeological proof of these things. Uh, I was sharing this morning, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm, re I'm reading and learning myself, but um, I was reading about how they discovered um, the mummies of giants and the average height of them was nine feet. And actually they discovered these apparently um, in a in a cave kind of thing under the Grand Canyon. And so here they were, the average height was nine. I think there were 90 of them, something like that. They, they, we go, the, the proof is there, okay, that they exist in. Uh, again, I'm going to let you read for yourself because a whole lot of what I'm putting up here are scholars that, again, you can screenshot, you can research for yourself. And I just included a lot of them just as confirmation of people that said, yep, it happened. And this went down through the generations. Uh, and Clement of Alexandria, wild in manners and greater than men in size inasmuch as they were sprung of angels, yet less than angels as they were born of women, not being pleased with purity of food. They longed only after the taste of blood, wherefore they first tasted flesh, all things, therefore going from bad to worse on account of these brutal demons. God wished to cast them away like an evil leaven that left each generation from a wicked seed being like that uh, before it and equally impious th should empty the world to become saved of men. So over and over, we read that, that what happened in Genesis or what we read about in the Bible really happened as much. It, it's hard to understand. I get it. <laughs> but that doesn't negate the fact that it happened. And so you can see, again, uh, more scholars that I, I, I provided here. They were um, propagated to overflowing and uh, just a depraved world. They fell into impure love of virgins and were subjected by the flesh and became negligent and wicked. Wicked. Uh, again, they, they, they devoured blood. They loved blood. Uh, they defiled even animals. Uh, you know, the, this this account goes on and on and on. And it's interesting to think about, you know, we were talking about this morning, how when we uh, visited the ark in Kentucky, you know, they depicted, you know, the living quarters of Noah and his family. And there was actually a library there. These books, the book of Enoch, the book of the Jubilees, all of these things that I'm sharing would have been with Noah on the ark. Why? Because he, because he, you know, he was learned. Is because that he brought the heritage, his ancestors, all these things with him on the ark. You know, so it, these things survived that the the flood, and we're reading about some of the things that you know the account of the giants and that sort of thing. The book of Jubilees, the watchers sinned with the daughters of men, for these had begun to unite themselves so as to be defiled. With the daughters of men the book of jubilees goes on and on there's several um you know uh, statements comments if you will but i want to summarize what we're reading here 
So we go to Genesis 6, 1, and uh, it, it says what, that as they were multiplying, right, it was a time of exploding population. I shared this morning that um, I read where, you know, that just from Adam, you know, they could account for 2 million people coming from the seed of Adam during Adam's lifetime, okay? And so it's interesting, the, the time of exploding population. Now, we have a whole lot of talk about that going on, you know, world population, slow it down. We don't have enough resources, which I don't believe for a second, by the way, but we do have a, a, a growth here. So today we have 8 billion people worldwide, and they say by in the next year or two, at the most, we'll have 10 billion people. We're experiencing the same thing, exploding population worldwide. And by the way, the number one uh, demographic growth, if you will, is the Muslim world. See, they believe that if there's more of us and there's more of them, <laughs> they win. And so they're populating at great speed, far faster uh, than the Christian world is. So it's a time of exploding population. Check it is today. Genesis 2 was also a time of unthinkable sexual perversion. Well, you don't have to be you know, awake even to realize what we're seeing out there in terms of sexual perversion. It's off the charts. So much of it is demonic. And so we're seeing this all over the world. It's the, 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 the relation between husband and wife is gone. It's, it's like bisexuals, you know, all, all this stuff that we see. It's so far gone. I remember reading not, uh, oh gosh, it's been a few years now, but it said that the generation of my children, so my my uh, my oldest is 40, so the generation of my children was the fastest moral decline of any generation we've ever tracked before. And so it's it's declining. Genesis 6-2 it was a time of dark spiritual activity. Listen, but do you um, want to think it or not, whether you can accept thinking it or not. The demonic world is a real world. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. And so there's dark spiritual activity taking place. The more we, uh, you know, uh, don't talk about the Lord, the more we put him in a closet, the more we say, we're not going to pray in schools. We're not going to have the Ten Commandments. We're not going to do this. You know, the, the more the dark spiritual activity. Now, I live in a region that is notorious for having a lot of witches and warlocks. It's a dark spiritual place, right? And so we have a big job trying to reach people. But it was a, a time during the uh, days of Noah, dark spiritual activity. It certainly is for us today. Then there's Genesis 6, 4. It was a time when transhumanism occurred. And, and, and today, that's what scientists are tampering with, you know, gender and genetics and, uh, you know, p gender confusion and all this stuff going on, really creating a, a, this, a transhuman. You know, we're, there are two genders. Hang up, push the delete button, whatever you want to do. But God created man and woman, and he makes no mistakes. He didn't make a woman that was supposed to be a man or a man that was supposed to be a woman. And so we're playing with genetics. Another side of that is that, you know, uh, when we look at the demonic world, you know, we, we're, I heard um, Elon Musk, uh, you know, it, it said that we had to slow down all this um, intellectual, uh, you know, things that he has going on. Because in other words, uh, you have all the intellectual things that actually have a conscious. He, he referred to it as a conscious. And he said, if we're not careful, that will take over the conscious of man. And so it, it, it's at a scary place. Now, listen, that's not science, okay, or technology. That's the devil himself. And so he's masquerading in all kinds of things. But the bottom line is, it was a time then when, uh, you know, transhumanism, again, we had the fallen angels go with the women and they had babies. And today we're, we're tampering with many weird things uh, that, that could equate to transhumanism. It's creating monstrous things and, and, and like the things that happened uh, in the world before the flood. Then Genesis 6, 5, it was a time when evil was continually in the hearts of man. And today, you know, we're seeing <laughs> inventions of evil like in, in anything we've ever seen. Again, my the generation of my kids, the fastest moral the, the Decline. Uh, we we have never witnessed what we're witnessing today, which is why so many of us say, "What in the world is going on?" It's similar to what was happening in the days of the flood. And as we get closer, the Bible says, "As in the days of Noah." So as we get closer to the time when He'll call His people up to be raptured, right, or then the second coming of Christ. After that, you know, we're going to see some weird stuff. That's the bottom line. If it's going to be as in the days of Noah. Now, Genesis 6, 11, it was a time of widespread violence. And boy, oh boy, it, it, you can't, I, I for one can't watch the news. It's too depressing for me. I see all this stuff. And today we're seeing rebellion and violence and 
you know, families killing families and, and, and kids going against the parents. And it, it's unspeakable what we're seeing. And it's and it's and it's growing. OK, more and more and more and more. It's not just that we have uh, social media and we see it now. It is growing more now. And so that evil side, the rebellious side, the violent side is growing. Again, Genesis 6, 4 with that transhumanism, when when human beings began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born of them, sons of God saw that they were beautiful, right? And he said, my spirit won't contend with them. So in, in verse four, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterward, when the sons of God went to the daughters of, 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 of humans and children and had children by them. So they were the heroes of old. So we can't negate it. Hebrews 1, 7, um, you know, it says that by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not seen, move with godly fear. We're supposed to, folks, live out our salvation with fear and trembling, okay? This is not a, a, a walk in the park, and certainly it's not a, a journey for wussies. But, you know, we're, uh, he's was moved with godly fear. He prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness was according to faith. We need to be like Noah. We need to be so willing to take the word of God for what it is. See, see, he had the benefit that I didn't have. I didn't have a Christian family. And I certainly don't even know of people that really had the teachings of the word of God. They may have had the faith of the word of God, but not the teachings. Noah had it all. Noah had a great line of purity, of righteousness, you know, that passed on from generation to generation. When God spoke to Noah, he'd already heard there would be judgment. And so he didn't hesitate to do, I want to be like Noah. I want when God to speak to me, that I will step up. And remember, he was a righteous man. He was a preacher of righteousness. So the 120 years, he's laboring away to build this ark with his family precisely as God told him to build it. He was preaching judgments coming judgments coming judgments coming and it's going to come again i want to be like noah i want to be one of the ones that stands in the gap that runs the race doesn't matter how long it takes doesn't matter if it's 120 years right uh you know i i, I want to be one i want to be like noah and frankly guys listen we all have our own gifts we all were born for a, a purpose that you know god intended for each one uh, but we all have one thing else in common and that is that we all have been given a job description, the Great Commission, the Great Commission and sharing the gospel, talking about judgment, forewarning people of what's coming. That's not just for preachers and teachers. That's for everyone proclaiming uh, Jesus Christ as Lord. And so I want to be like Noah. Matthew 24, 37. Again, it says, but as in the days of Noah, remember from the very beginning, it says precisely that word means exactly as it was in the days of Noah. So shall also the coming of the son of man be. And so we need to be ready. Uh, I, I get so much um, feedback and you know, people sending me emails and whatever after they watch a, a video or they or join us here on church or whatever. And, 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 and they try to tell me when it's going to happen. Like you're, you're wrong. Um, if the rapture isn't soon. It, you know what? It's not worth dividing over. None of us know. Okay. We, we read, we study, we do our best to understand it. None of us know, but all of us agree that it's coming. Okay. And I personally think that it's not too far away, but if I live like that, if I live like it's now, if I live like it's soon, I can't go wrong. And I have to think that if someone lives as if it's generations away, they might just be inclined to live like that. And so, listen, it's he's coming and I want to be ready. And, you know, his judgment's going to come. I want to be like Noah, again, preaching the righteousness in a dark, dark world. The world is getting darker by the minute. And, it, you know, if we stay that course, no matter how long it takes, if we stay the course, it took Noah to 120 years and we won't live that long. But, you know, no matter what, if we stay the course, then the favor of God will be upon us just as it was with Noah. You know, he's looking for his people to stand up. He's he's looking for his remnant to grow and to be strong. And he's looking for his remnant to encourage the rest of people professing faith, right, to try to get them on board for what's coming. And so we've got to equip ourselves, me with you and you with me. So as it was in the days of Noah. 